Hi, this is Kelsey Pukowski for AP Gov Review, and in Chapter 3, Part 3, we're going to be continuing our discussion on federalism. And this is a very important concept that you will definitely see in some form, whether on the multiple choice or the FRQ, or even both on the AP Gov exam. So we had talked about previously about dual federalism and cooperative uh, federalism in Chapter 3, Parts 1 and 2. And we noticed that, of course, dual federalism, where the states and the national government were acting in their own spheres, they were really limited interaction between the two. And then after 1930, we began to see cooperative federalism, where the state and the national government are working together. There's a lot more overlap. Well, fiscal federalism is very much in line with cooperative federalism. And by definition, this is the pattern of spending, taxing, and providing grants in the federal system. Remember, in the federal system, you have the sharing of power, and you also are going to have the sharing of funds in forms of taxation. And in many ways, this is the cornerstone of the national government's relations with the state and local governments. The best way to impact the state and the local governments is with, of course, money. And if you look at the federal budget, you'll see that 51% of it has to deal with health uh, 10% transportation, 11% education, 19% income uh, security. And within these major sectors, this is where you're going to see major grants going to the states. And the states certainly like what they see as free money. And if you see over time, the amount of money that the federal government has granted to the state and local governments has significantly expanded over time. If you just look about in 1955, you're maybe at two or four billion dollars and even when this is adjusted to inflation i mean this by 2010 you're approaching about 480 billion dollars which is a very very large sum of money so the amount of grants has certainly increased over time so the grant system is of course distributing the federal pie the federal dollars there's uh, two types of grants the first one being categorical grants and these are the grants that have strings attached. They say, yes, we'll give you this money, but you have to do this. And uh, typically there are strings attached uh, and requirements uh, that are going along with that money. And those could become uh, project grants where it could be a specific project, the building of a bridge or some other road project, let's say. Whereas a formula grant is where money is going to be distributed to everybody but there's a formula, so it's going to dictate how much money you get. For example, if you're in New Jersey, which has a sizable population, you're probably gonna get more money on a formula grant if population's based on it, as opposed to, let's say, Montana, which is much more sparse. The second type of grant is called a block grant, and these are the grants that states love because it gives a lot of discretion to the states and local governments. There are typically no strings attached I mean, almost think of it as a block, right? They can mold it into that block to however they want to meet, however they feel fit. So there are no strings attached. Typically, states are going to undoubtedly prefer a block grant over a categorical grant because categorical grant is telling the states how they have to spend it. There are requirements, whereas block grants, they can basically do what they see fit. All right, so there is certainly a scramble for federal dollars. You know, roughly 460 billion plus in grants is given away every year. That number has certainly increased. Uh, that's a 2010 figure. Nevertheless, um, you do see some type of universalism in the sense that every state typically will get something, but certainly states with higher population and higher infrastructure needs are probably going to see more money coming their way. But really, the big problem the mandate blues. So, a mandate is typically coming from the national government and it directs the state or the local government to comply with federal rules under the threat of penalties or as a condition of receipt of a federal grant. Basically, it means that the states have to follow the rules outlined by the federal government. And if they don't, they can have money withheld, there can be some type of penalty, they might lose a grant. And states, of course, hate being told what to do. I mean, almost think of the states as like a child and the federal government is the parent and the parent is bossing around the state. You have to do this. Oh, you have to do that. States hate mandates. And what mandate do they hate the most? Unfunded, man unfunded mandates. A good example of this is when the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. 
which basically stated that buildings had to uh, fit and be handicap accessible. And if you had to build, let's say, a new uh, wheelchair ramp outside of a state courthouse building, well, the states are going to have to pay for that. There's going to be no money attached to that. And states hate that because they're being told not only what to do, but then now they're being forced to spend money. And if you think about all the public uh, amenities that are offered by state governments, that's a pretty penny that they're going to have to pay, especially if you're a state the size of California that probably has more court buildings, more public buildings just in general. So unfunded mandates are very much hated because they are being told what to do and they have to spend money. Now, as I was telling you about between federal and state relations, right, they've become much closer from the 1930s all the way up until around Reagan is president in the 1980s. And there's this new concept at that time known as devolution. And that's where you're transferring the policies of the federal government to the state and local governments. So you're really reducing the size of bureaucracy, something known for uh, by Reagan as part of Reaganomics. And there was, you know, by transferring these services from the federal to the state governments, you're guaranteeing no financial support. Um, and this was part of, again, Reagan's ideals of that there's just basically too much federal control and that programs, for example, like Medicare would be better handled at the state level. So when we look at federalism as a whole, you have your advantages and you have your disadvantages. Major advantages, well, it increases access to government. Uh, you have more opportunities. You can also solve problems locally. So what might work for Montana, they can do their own thing, while Kansas and maybe Florida does their own thing. It's also an advantage with federalism in the sense that political parties or interest groups cannot dominate all politics. There are about 87,000 governments in the United States. When you look at local governments, you look at county governments, state governments. So it is very hard for political parties or interest groups to dominate all of that. So you again, more opportunities for participation. Certainly there are disadvantages with respect to federalism that states have different levels of service. You know that, for example, when you look at education. In New Jersey, you're spending a pretty penny, eighteen to $20,000 per student, whereas if you go to a, a Midwestern state, you're gonna see that much lower. For example, Oklahoma uh, spends a lot less money. So this, the level of service you might be getting is going to vary. And also local interests can counteract national interests as well. Uh, a good example of that is when the Affordable Care Act was passed, you had states such as Texas suing the national government to have the repeal of the so-called Obamacare. So certainly you have that happening too, uh, as well. And then also there's the argument that there are just too many levels of government and too much money is being spent. Uh, a good example, and I'll fast forward through this to this table right here, the number of governments in America, as I mentioned earlier, 87,576. I mean, if you look at the number of just, for example, school districts, you're looking at 13,500. Townships or towns, you're looking at another 16,000. Municipalities, another 19,000. 3,000 counties uh, and counting. So there's a lot of overlap in some sense. And to have governments you know, stay afloat, you have, it costs a lot of money, and certainly that has been an argument floated out. And I just want to backtrack just for a second. As I was talking about state and local spending on public education and how the level of service can certainly vary, and these numbers are from 2005, so forgive that they're a little outdated, but keep this in mind when adjusted for inflation, you still have these wide gaps. So if you look, for example, at Kansas, you might only spend $8,500 on education, whereas in New Jersey, they're spending $13,740. Uh, so you have spending amounts that are very different and that can certainly impact the level of service one might receive, especially in education. Okay, so understanding federalism and its scope, really these are questions as to what should the scope of the national government be relative to the states? So should the national government have a lot more power over the states? Uh, should more, for example, with Reagan's devolution idea should more of the responsibilities be given to the states. But certainly one thing that holds true is that national power has increased over time. We see this with civil rights. We've seen this with the Industrial Revolution. We've seen this with the Civil War. Keep that in mind. And a lot of problem, problems do require resources that states cannot afford, especially states that might only have a 20 to $30 billion budget every year can't afford certain things that they need. So they need the federal government to step in, which has 
a plethora of resources and money compared to the state governments, where we're talking trillion dollar budgets at the national government level. States are nowhere near that. So certainly sometimes the problems do require federal intervention. And if you look at just fiscal federalism in this graph, you've seen steady spending increases over time. So in summary, as we conclude our discussion on federalism is a governmental system in which power is shared. You have to really keep that in mind. Power is shared thanks to the 10th Amendment where you have reserved powers for the states. Um, and we see that uh, certainly today. And the United States has moved from dual to cooperative federalism, which is, of course, part of fiscal federalism, where the states and the national governments are working together. And we certainly have reviewed advantages and disadvantages to democracy, as there are with everything uh, in life. So I'm going to conclude with two review questions. Which type of government funding allows states the most discretion? Take a moment to think about that. And if you said block grants, you would be correct because remember, think about it like almost like a block of marble. You can sculpt it in any way that you want. States love that. There are really no strings attached as opposed to categorical grants, um, which mandate states to do certain things. So block grants are the preferred type of grant for states. I'll give you another review question. Take a moment to read it and I will reveal the answer momentarily. All right, the terms fiscal federalism and cooperative federalism refer to situations in which, and if you said the last choice, federal, state, and local governments work together, key word being together, to complete a project with the federal government providing much of the project funding, you would be correct. Because again, with fiscal federalism, you have the federal government providing money in terms of some type of grant. And with cooperative federalism, you have the state and the national governments working together. So if you got that correct, kudos to you. And this concludes Unit 1 of Constitutional Underpinnings.